Welcome back to the Lowdown on Physics. This is screencast number six in the area of study of uh, interactions of light and matter. This is the second study that we're doing first in Unit 4 Physics. Uh, today we'll be looking at something called matter waves. So following on from where we kind of ended up in the last screencast, we're talking about light sort of having this dual nature that it acted as waves, but then it demonstrated some particle-like um, features. So this guy uh, by the name of de Broglie basically started a reason and said light appears to act like particles. Maybe particles might actually have some wave characteristics. It might do some things that we would expect of waves. So he got the momentum equation. And de Broglie uh, basically started to wonder if the relationship between momentum and wavelength for light would you know, apply to particles as well. Could, could we apply that same principle? So he rearranged this equation. And rearranging, we can see over here we've got uh, wavelength equals Planck's constant over momentum. Momentum is mass times velocity. So if some mass is moving with a given velocity, then we should be able to calculate its wavelength where h is Planck's constant in joules. Electron volts is not going to apply in this scenario. So basically what he's saying is particles might behave or will behave as if it has a particular value of wavelength. So if a particle's moving at some given speed, it will behave like um, like a wave of a given wavelength. So we, we will get some of these common features. It will do some things in common with, uh, with waves and what we would expect of a, a given wavelength. So notice here we're talking about in terms of like an electron acting with like like a wavelength of 1.5 nanometers, say. Now, this is not going to be something that we'll notice on the everyday. Like clearly we don't see um, cars driving through a, an opening into a garage and, and diffracting. Um, and, and there's, you know, very good reason. Once we sort of get down into the, the mathematics of it, then you know it will become very obvious that it's it's only going to occur under a very very minute number of circumstances. But what it does do is help explain some of the results we do see at an, an atomic level. We're talking really small particles moving at high speeds. So what I want you to recall is diffraction is only going to occur when the wavelength is similar in size to the aperture or the the particle that's going around. So if we see diffraction from particles, then we would assume that, yes, it's, it's displaying wave-like properties because, well, automatically, we know that um, diffraction is a wave property, and that's what we spent the first part of this topic talking about. Okay, so let's look at it in terms of an everyday scenario. We have a cricket ball. It's 150 grams. It's traveling at 30 meters per second. Let's have a look at the wavelength that that would produce. Substituting in, we've got H over MV, putting that into kilograms, of course. And we get a wavelength of 1.5 times 10 to the negative 34. Okay, that, that is exceptionally small, clearly, by the negative 34. Now, if we want to detect such a wavelength, we need to pass a cricket ball through a slit or an aperture that is less than the diameter of a proton. So clearly we're not going to observe that. Even if we were to slow this velocity down so it was moving at one meter per second or a half a meter per second, you know, it's going to have very little. We're talking 10 to the negative 33 or 10 to the negative 32. Very little effect on um, being able to observe such a wavelength. So let's let's have a look at an example then where we might be able to make such an observation. So let's let's say, so we call this the, the, the de Broglie wavelength, so we're talking, anytime you see de Broglie wavelength we're talking about the wavelength of a particle 
which kind of just sounds odd anyway saying that. So we have an electron from rest through 100 volts. How much uh, potential energy is this going to gain? Or how much potential energy is there we've got that's going to be converted to uh, kinetic energy? So when we pass one electron through, it's going to gain 100 electron volts. Now, electron volts doesn't work here. We're talking in terms of joules. So converting that to joules, we've got 1.602 times 10 to the negative 17 joules, or 100 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19, which is the charge on the electron. So, substituting that in to the kinetic energy equation, rearranging, we want to find the velocity. So, E equals a half mv squared. So, rearranging it, we're going to multiply by 2 on both sides, divide by m and take the square root. So, 2 times the energy divided by the mass. We get a velocity of almost 6 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. So, it's moving pretty quick by the time it gets out of this potential difference. So if we now substitute that into our um, wavelength equation, we end up with lambda equals h over mv. We end up with 1.2 times 10 to the negative 10. So now we're in the realms of nanometers. Now we're talking about values that are similar to the wavelengths that we've been observing or getting getting within that sort of region. Okay, still smaller, but we're now in that, that sort of ballpark figure. So we now might have gaps that it could be accelerated through so that we can uh, see this observation. Um, basically, whilst it's you know, going to be pretty, pretty hard making an aperture that small, it is very similar to the spacing in atoms in a crystal lattice structure. So we get the, uh, you know, if we can fire these electrons at a crystal, then we may be able to observe um, some diffraction, which would be a wave-like property. And in fact, that's what actually happened. So not, not to Broglie himself, he, he came up with a theory. It was later on um, that we had uh, the two scientists, uh, Davison and Germer, who were able to fire these electrons in and then detect what was happening at the other side. Basically, it produced a diffraction pattern very similar to when it fired x-rays at the uh, crystal structure. So getting that similar pattern meant that we've got similar wavelengths. However, we're firing a, firing a particle. So we've got a particle producing um, a wavelength prop or oh, you know a, a wave property so from the scattering of the electrons they were then able to do the calculations and find a wavelength for the electrons this is you know using practical or um, uh, what's the word uh, gone anyway forget it um, so rather than a theoretical value they've now found a practical value maybe practical is the right word seems to fit now anyway so we um, confirm so what, what's happened here is they've confirmed it experimentally that's the word I was looking for before so electrons aren't the only other things like they've fired um, protons neutrons and other small particles like say um, a hydrogen atom and fired them at crystal structures and they've been able to observe diffraction with those as well. So let's have a look here. Two images. One has been uh, produced through the diffraction or the scattering of electrons, the other with x-rays. Okay, So they're off the same collection of crystals and pictures are the same scale so what we can actually do is compare the distance between antinodes and use it to calculate our, um, our wavelength for the particles.